Howdy. This lecture is going to talk about uh, a technique that we use to interpret diffraction data. Um, and this is called Rietveld refinement, or whole pattern fitting. Uh, and the point is that we have our observed data. So let's say we have a bunch of black dots are, are indicating the observed data, which is showing us intensity as a function of this scattering angle. So the angle is 2 theta. Uh, and we'd like to uh, extract as much information from that as possible. Um, but the function that we're using to create this predicted line is very complicated. Um, and so that means that we have to be very careful and we have to do um, a number of things so that we can sort of um, do this inverse uh, refinement problem um, as cautiously as possible, um, but in order to uh, land at a, a stable uh, prediction in terms of the structure. So, uh, you know, um, I'm just going to say that this lecture is a little out of place. I probably should have uh, brought it up um, before uh, in class. Um, but, you know, this is something that we're going to need uh, to talk about for you to complete your project number two. Um, and so that's why we're uh, going to take a day to um, focus on questions of structural refinement. Um, so just as a quick refresher, remember x-ray diffraction data can give us a lot of different information about different aspects of the material. There are peak positions, uh, and those positions tell us generally something about the lattice itself. Um, there are peak intensities, and those intensities are related to which atoms are sitting where within the unit cell, uh, but also to things like preferential orientation. Uh, and then there are shape effects, and shape, uh, peak shape is uh, dominated by your diffractometer itself, but there are also things about the material, so uh, epitaxial film quality, or if there's um, some uh, residual strain in your system, or if your grain size is small. These are all things that can affect uh, the peak shape. Um, so when we solve for structures, you know, we can kind of break it down into two aspects of the same problem. One is just phase ID. Um, you know, think about it like a fingerprint. What phases are present in the system? If you scoop up a bunch of, uh, you know, sand at the beach or, or you, you know, you take a material that you've synthesized and you grind it up and you put it under the diffractometer. Phase ID is just what phases are there. Um, and then the phase refinement is basically going one step further because when you refine the whole pattern, you can get additional information, um, like where are atoms sitting within the unit cell? Are they ordered or are they disordered? Um, and you can get these uh, things that are affecting peak shape as well. Uh, so just as some quick examples, let's say you're, you're involving in, in processing. This could be you know, a, either a classical you know, a, a metallurgy problem, you could be working in a thin film semiconductor industry, you're trying to make some material. Um, and the process conditions are very important. Um, because in some cases you could accidentally make phases you don't want. In some cases you could make mostly a phase of interest, but you could have a little bit of something else in there that's totally throwing the properties of your material off. Um, so it's very common to go back and check. You make the thing, but now let's go back and check what crystalline phases are present in the system. Uh, and that would be a phase ID problem, but you could also learn something about those phases. So for example, are they ordered or disordered? Uh, what is the composition? Because in a lot of cases, composition is uh, related to the lattice parameters. So sometimes you can back that up as well. Um, another example might be a, a failure problem. So let's say you make the world's greatest alloy and you're using it and then it, it fails. Maybe it is fractured, maybe it is corroded, uh, and you'd like to know why. Um, and so again, sometimes it's caused by um, a, uh, an additional phase that was present in the system initially that you didn't expect to see. Maybe there's something where the, the material is interacting with the environment and it's, uh, it's having a chemical reaction, so creating new materials. If you identify what those uh, components are, um, you could potentially design ways to limit uh, their creation in the future. So there are a lot of reasons why you would need to do these kind of problems. Um, and, and again, I just want to say very generally, uh, the problem is that we have a number of observations. So each individual intensity uh, point, um, you know, it, we're measuring this as a function of the scattering angle. And at each scattering angle, we have a particular intensity point, uh, And that counts as an observation. Um, and so you could think about this as a very complicated function. Um, it's a function of a whole bunch of different parameters. And those parameters are do again in part to your diffractometer, but also in part to the material itself. And what we'd like to generate is some model function, so the black line here, that fits those observations as closely as possible. Um, and what we 
generally do is we look at the difference between these two uh, to say how good of a job uh, doing, th doing that objective are we? Like how good are we at recreating the uh, observations with the model that we're using? Um, so anytime you have a model that's you know, a complicated thing, it's a, it's a function of many um, different parameters, oftentimes you can't just hit go and solve for all of those parameters um, simultaneously. Um, and, and so this is an example of a, ultimately a least squares regression problem where we're going to keep changing parameters individually and then simultaneously later on um, to reduce the overall misfit. Um, and that means we're going to calculate um, terms based on this difference um, that are telling us how good of a job are we doing um, at fitting those observations with our model. Um, so generally, uh, Reit Felt refinement, um, you know, the, the first thing that happens in terms of uh, when, it's, when it's calculating a prediction is it's going to calculate the positions and intensities that are associated with diffraction from different families of peaks. So maybe uh, this is our, you know, our HKL peak over here. Um, and given that particular um, uh, family of planes, um, we know a multiplicity, we know a despacing that gives us the position of it. You know, we know what atoms are in the unit cell so that we can calculate a structure factor. And from this information, we can, we can calculate the intensity or what we expect the intensity to be of each of these different peaks. Um, but on a real diffraction system, the, the peak is not a perfect delta function, right? There's some um, finite width to it. Um, and so we get this wick by convoluting that intensity, that, that this, um, you know, this infinitely narrow uh, spike with the profile shape. Um, and so each of these um, peaks has some profile shape. And, and the peak shape, again, it might have some terms that are angularly dependent, so they might get a little bit broader up here. That's okay. Um, but it has a shape that we can describe, and we apply that shape equally to all of the different peaks. Um, and, you know, uh, one example is that in a real diffraction system, um, oftentimes we have multiple kinds of um, uh, wavelengths. We're not totally looking at a single wavelength. So in a lab system, we use copper K-alpha, but there's actually a K-alpha-1 and a K-alpha-2 um, fluorescence line, which means that we have two very closely spaced wavelengths of radiation that are interacting with our material. And so all of that gets taken into account when we look at the profile shapes. Um, so the next thing is that we realize that there is some general background. Um, and the background is something that we can fit with, you know, a linear function or some of these sort of fancier um, uh, polynomial functions, but, but basically this is just uh, talking about um, this background scattered radiation um, that, you know, if you hit your sample with an x-ray beam, there's always going to be some um, x-ray radiation that's scattering off, um, uh, you know, at, at no matter what angle the sample is positioned at. So that background um, is defined by a function as well. Um, so finally, we just add all these things together. You add up each of those individual peaks, um, you add them up uh, on top of the background, and that gives us this, uh, this kind of fuchsia curve, or magenta curve here, um, which is our overall model prediction. Um, and then we compare the model prediction against the observation. So maybe these blue dots are actual data points um, that we've collected. Um, and we come in here and we say, how good of a job did we do? And, and we can, for each particular uh, angle that we have measured an intensity at, we can take the difference between uh, that observed point, that blue dot, uh, and the predicted model point. Um, and so that's this y i observed minus y i calculated. Um, and ultimately, we want to minimize the difference of this thing. Um, so this is uh, this is basically the sum, the weighted sum of the of the squares. Um, and remember, this is a least squares minimization. Um, uh, least squares minimization process. And so, you know, we add up all of these for each of those individual um, observations. So I is just, uh, you know, um, representing uh, a data point that is at some particular angle. Um, and we're trying to overall minimize the sum of the squares. Um, and that's another way of saying we're trying to get our model to fit the observed data as good as possible. Now, um, based on that, uh, that difference, you know, we can calculate a number of quantitative measures of 
how good is our fit? You, know, you, can, you can think of these as figures of merit. Um, and it's nice to be able to reduce your overall fit to a number. And that's exactly what these things are. So the weighted residual RWP and the goodness of fit, these are probably the two most common ones that you see. Um, again, they're, they're sort of weighted. That weighting term um, uh, takes into account where are their actual peaks. We care more about that versus um, versus somewhere in the background. So it's allowing you to weight the importance of a particular peak. Um, uh, uh, goodness of fit, you know, it's related to how many free parameters uh, there are uh, in the uh, overall uh, refinement. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this again, and we'll talk about this when we do the tutorials. Um, this is just a number, and the most important thing is just visually inspecting your peaks. Because there are cases where you can get good RWP, but it's sort of at the cost of a, you know, of a, of a physical, uh, a real fitting, and the, your peaks uh, can clearly show that. Um, so, you know, again, we report these numbers, but we realize that the best measure of how good your, um, your refinement is, is to actually look at the peaks and inspect and, and understand why we're, um, you know, our model data is or is not um, lining up with the predicted uh, or with the observed data set. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, when you do all these things together and you do them right, you know, it's hard to see because they've done such a good job fitting, but their, their model here in the black points is almost exactly overlapping the observed data here in the white circles. Um, and so the difference curve is very flat all the way um, across this peak. Um, if the difference curve is not flat, that's indicative of what you need, which parameters you probably need to go in and do better at. So we're going to talk about those uh, in a little bit. Um, just generally, there are a couple problems, you know, because this is a nonlinear function. Um, the, the two biggest things that you might encounter when you're doing a refinement are um, either a false minima. So, you know, maybe, so for just some general parameter x, um, if you start off in the wrong place, uh, or if you, you know, you don't, um, you know, maybe you refine the wrong things in the wrong order, you can sometimes get trapped in these false minima. So sometimes you have to back up. Um, sometimes you have to choose a different starting position um, because really we want to uh, be sitting over here. Um, but in this particular case, you know, the, the thing is being forced down here and then it's not allowing it to, um, to cover enough of a parameter space to find the real, uh, the real minima. Um, the other thing that can happen uh, is that your parameters can um, go haywire on you, meaning they can overshoot and then they can kind of get in these cases where they get into non-physically real values uh, and, and the, um, the fit can rapidly degrade. Um, so usually refinement software, um, it has every time you do a refinement, it sort of ask you like, do you like this result? Would you like to uh, proceed? And the reason it does that is, you know, if, if you do something wrong and your values go haywire, then you can immediately tell it by um, looking at these uh, figures of merit because usually they've blown up on you. Um, right. So this is a case where, you know, we could call it being trapped. Uh, in this case, you've, you've exploded. You've kind of gone out of bounds. Um, so uh, there are uh, a few practical rules to always remember when going through this process. Um, the first is uh, to rev usually we want to introduce new variables one at a time. Um, if we introduce too many variables all at one time, and particularly if those variables are strongly correlated, um, it tends to lead to some of the problems that we just talked about. Um, the other thing is, you know, that the order, the sequence in which you refine variables matters. Um, and usually, you know, you tell what sequence you should be using by looking at your data. Um, and again, we're going to talk about what the data is telling you in, in a little bit. But, um, you know, by understanding which parameters are further off, this can help you figure out which ones to refine first. And, and the thing that you always want to do is you want to refine those parameters of the, that are the furthest off first, because otherwise, you know, you might, um, you might try and refine something that's having very little effect because some other variable is too far out of whack. Um, you know, it's tempting to just sort of hit refine and just kind of check the boxes, go, 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 go. But oftentimes that leads to, um, again, to uh, some of the problems. Uh, and it's helpful to sort of 
save frequently, mark, uh, you know, um, values down that you, um, that you refine to that uh, uh, seem to be working so that if you do do something wrong, it goes haywire, you kind of have a, a, a step to um, uh, fall back on. Um, if this was an easy black box solution, then we wouldn't be talking about it because, you know, we'd all just put it in our program and hit go. Um, there are a lot of commercial packages out there now that are pretty robust, uh, but it's important that you understand what, um, what these things are trying to do. Um, finally, there are a few variables, particularly when we talk about peak shape and, you know, this is either B ISO or U ISO value, these, uh, thermal parameters for, um, phases that they can, they have a greater tendency than other, uh, variables to, um, to go, uh, to go bad, to cause problems. Um, so be careful when you're working with those particular variables. Um, and finally, you know, again, don't just look at this RWP number, look at what is happening to the peaks and to how good of a job you're doing fitting, uh, the observed peaks, um, because that's the thing, um, that is, uh, most important overall. Um, so we're going to look at some examples of curves that, uh, are a little bit off, um, and try and understand what it, what it is about it, um, that is, uh, you know, um, wrong. And, and particularly, we're going to try and uh, relate it to some particular uh, parameters that we would need to go back and change. Uh, and so in this case, you know, uh, there's a good fit shown off to the left. And this is good because the difference curve, that's this bottom one, uh, is basically flat and constant all the way across that peak. So that's what we're trying to get to. Um, you could have a case where the overall intensity is, uh, is either high or is low. Um, and so this is the difference, and the difference is calculated as the, you know, the observed minus the model. So the circles are the observations, the line is the model. And so if you're doing observed minus model, in this case, the difference is uniformly positive. In this case, the difference is uniformly negative. So this is the case where the intensity of your peak is off. Uh, and the question is, which of these parameters are associated with peak intensity? I'll give you one second to think about that. Uh, so peak intensities are, you know, strongly dependent on atomic positions, atomic, atomic occupancy, which atoms are sitting where. So if you start to introduce disorder in a system, that could affect intensities, uh, and preferred orientation. They don't depend, uh, you know, strongly on lattice parameters. They don't depend as much on uh, profile shape or, or on some of these other things. Background is basically just, you know, uh, that would affect everything uniformly. Um, so if you are off in your intensities, meaning that the, uh, the difference curve is, you know, just totally negative or totally positive, then these are the things, these orange boxes are the things that you want to try refining. So this case is a little bit different. Um, and so what we see is we see a positive difference on the left hand and a negative difference on the right hand side. Uh, so similarly, uh, we could, it could be flipped. So we have a negative difference on the left hand and a positive difference on the right hand side. Uh, and what this means, if you look closely, is that your peak position is not quite right. Um, so for example, in this case, the observed points are a little bit higher than the model on the left hand side, but the observed points are a little bit lower than the model on the right hand side uh, and the other way around over here. Um, and so again, that means that uh, you know, if you see this kind of a feature, this, it looks like um, a single pulse from an echocardiograph or something, um, uh, then that means your peak positions are not right. So which of these parameters is going to change peak positions? So the peak positions are most strongly dependent on two things, the lattice parameters, so the unit cell size and angles, um, and what's called the shift or, or, or zero offset. So again, if your sample is not exactly in the middle of the diffractometer, if it's a little bit high or a little bit low, that can cause peak positions to shift, uh, and they shift to slightly different um, uh, amounts as a function of two theta. Uh, so if you see something like this, um, and particularly if you see this at high and at low curves, then these are the things that you need to go back in and try refining. Um, and finally, um, I like to call these things W's or M's, um, and it's not as pronounced here. Sometimes you'll see it, you know, it'll actually go 
pretty far negative, pretty far positive, negative, positive. But it's where you have this oscillating down, up, down, or up, down, up. Um, and these are indicators that your peak shape is not quite right. Because what it means is, you know, you're underestimating, or i um, sorry, you're overestimating the observed data here, you're underestimating it here, you're overestimating it here. So this peak is a little bit too wide, this peak is a little, little bit too, uh, too narrow. Um, and these are things that, uh, from the instrument side, um, there are a number of instrumental parameters. So, you know, when we talk about U, V, W, X, and Y, these are parameters that define the uh, function that we use to fit with peaks. Um, and then there are also things about the material itself. So things like the grain size or um, residual strain, those can affect um, uh, peak shapes as well. Um, a final point here, and I think I, um, so this is just summarizing that, um, is that the peak functions, you know, um, we actually use this thing that's called a, a, a pseudo Voigt function, or well, we, we use a Voigt function. A Voigt function is a convolution of two kinds of curves. It's a convolution of a Gaussian or Lorentzian. A pseudo Voigt is just a linear combination of those two. So picture a Gaussian curve and a Lorentzian curve, and you're just kind of adding them together. Um, and what does all this stuff mean? I mean, Gaussian curve, uh, there's a particular function that describes a Gaussian distribution. There's another function that describes a Lorentzian distribution. The biggest thing that you should know about this is that, you know, Lorentzian distributions put more weight in the tails um, versus Gaussian uh, distributions. And so by combining these two and by saying a real peak, it's a combination of a Gaussian and a Lorentzian, um, you know, we're able to deal with some of these asymmetry effects, but also you know, we're able to account for how much intensity is out here in the tails of the peaks. Um, so I think, you know, and uh, oftentimes we kind of focus more on the Gaussian terms, um, but if you're having um, more intensity out on your peaks, uh, then it's useful uh, to introduce the Lorentzian terms uh, into your refinement as well. Um, these are things that ultimately uh, they are largely functions of the x-ray diffractometer you're using. And so the best process to deal with this is you start off with a refinement standard, something that you know very well, something that strain and stress don't affect the peak shape at all. Um, and you run it on your particular diffractometer under the conditions you would run some other sample. Um, and you treat that as your reference sample and you determine these values for that particular system. Um, and so we gave you some quartz data to play with um, to do exactly that. So you can treat that quartz data as reference material um, and you can um, you know, pretend that strain and size don't uh, have any effect and you can refine the UVW and the X and Y and then you can create an instrumental parameter file um, and use that for other unknowns. Um, okay, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much.